Uh, okay, so um, this will be about uh, knowledge and freedom. So there is this uh, misconception or a common uh, understanding or a myth or a notion that uh, science is divided deeply from humanities. And maybe this is true about scientists as people, uh, although probably if one counted the percentage of scientists who love poetry or music or even play the piano, we probably go uh, better than some other groups like, let's say, dumb people or other groups. So, but this is not gonna be about people, right? It's about, about, about knowledge. So the, the, I won't surprise you and I won't prove anything to you. Uh, it's just that I wanna share with you my deep conviction, maybe more than a passion, uh, that knowledge is very, very important in human, in humane terms because it gives us freedom. And it largely, although not exclusively, of course, comes from science, okay? So it goes back to probably Immanuel Kant uh, that um, mm, humans, uh, to make free choices, they have to know what's going on, right? We have to have knowledge of at least the consequences of our choices so that our choices then can be judged from the moral standpoint. And also from other standpoints, right? like our benefit, right? We have to have knowledge to make free choices and thus be free people. So in this sense, this, 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 this very important aspect of humanity, freedom, depends on knowledge and that's how uh, science is so important. Now, in, I, I don't know much history, but, but I, I heard that in 1767, uh, Leopold Mozart, has not in, agreed to inoculate his son, little Wolfgang, against smallpox, because when he wrote it in his uh, probably biography or autobiography or something, he wanted to leave things up to the grace of God. And probably he made the right decision, uh, and in a sense that little Mozart, of course, got smallpox three years later, but survived, and then never got small, smallpox again. And maybe that was actually a good decision, but I'd like to argue that this was not a free decision because he just didn't know what he was talking about and what he was doing. So he was bound by his ignorance not to be a free person to make this decision for his own son, even if at the end maybe the decision was right. Now, I, Aristotle said, I think this is an opening to metaphysics, so fourth, fourth century BC, that humans uh, desire knowledge, that humans like to know. Actually, it's too bad because we so much want to know, we so much want to feel that we can predict stuff about ourselves, that we fool ourselves, that we do know, even though most of the time we don't know anything. Uh, so we, we cheat ourselves. We, we, we believe in some fake revelations and, and things and just, just, just kind of are comfortable with, with our present knowledge and are quite conservative in, in accepting new things, kind of paradoxically from, the, from this desire to know. Okay, but still, somehow, you know, we, we proceed, and, and, and humans, as, you know, as, as people, right, we, we all, we, we have some advancements in understanding of the world, and, and just on, on some examples from my field, from physics, we can see how far we have got since times of Aristotle, for example. So these three concepts have come from Aristotle, too. Like, you know, we come from geo, geocentrism through Copernican revolution to understanding that even the sun is not the, the origin of the universe. There is a galaxy, and this is not the only galaxy. There is many galaxies that, that move with respect to one another. Then there is dark matter, dark energy. We, we have gone quite far from this first notion over a couple of thousand years. Then we, we started with five elements building as constituents right, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the real world. And now then from this we went through Mendeleev periodic table, and now we have a standard model of elementary quantum particles and then we're looking for the Higgs particle right now. Right, then we, we had this notion of absolute rest thousands, couple thousand years ago. Then there was Galilean revolution, the Galilean principle of relativity. And now we believe that there is a four dimensional space time warped by, by the energy, but like, given, like described by Einstein. And there is, of course, even more uh, fascinating theories. So there have been revolutions in our understanding, even though we so much don't like them. And, uh, you know, humans have brains that evolved, and they evolved in what Richard Dawkins calls the medium world, which is not too fast, not too big, not too small. Just whatever we can access with our senses, this is how our brains, our capacity for, for, for concepts has, has evolved. And, but, but yet, 
we, we can now routinely test and even exploit things that don't make any sense to us because we, we probe reality at a level that's not intuitive to us. So even though you know, there is this conservatism that comes just from the fact that our brain is a, is a natural object and our mind is, though, uh, then, then still there is progress and we can exploit those. But, 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 but it is a fact that we have no intuition for a lot of stuff that we already can see, right? And, uh, and even among scientists themselves, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of conservatism, let alone about you know, ignorant people. And you, we, you can probably know this about the language, that, that people form language and change language when they're very young. Now, I'm afraid to say stuff like this about language because I don't know anything about language and there are people who know in, in the audience, but I read, let me put it this way, that people change language very eagerly when they're very young and when they are very smart, and then they pre prevent this language from changing. They kind of guard it from changing when they're old. And they're very conservative and they, they hate any changes because they think there is value in the language as it is, even though this is the language they made themselves when they were kids. So this is the same, of course, about science. People have to die and then... The, so now, this, there are some examples about weirdness from my field. And now, Christian has given in the first talk an example of the Schrodinger cat. This is much simpler. We know, you know the particles are waves, waves are particles, photons are particles also, and electrons are also waves. And although this, has, this idea of a planetary system of an atom has given Niels Bohr a Nobel Prize, it's just crap. It's not true. Absolutely, it's, just a, it's an attempt to make common sense of an atom, which is not true. In reality, or in, in, in more of a reality, uh, an electron can be at different places at the same time, and, 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 it, and still it's a particle like a rock, it's a small object. So when you throw electrons at obstacles or openings, they go through them like a wave, yet then they hit the screen as, as little particles of essentially zero size. It doesn't make any sense. We cannot make any sense of this. Right? This is reality, and it's just outside of our brain. Now, there, there's many other so-called paradoxes that just come from this incompatibility of our mind to, to the world against what Aristotle th thought that our mind is compatible with the world, and some of them is like the shredding. Now, science, of course, goes very s slowly in jumps, but there are some areas where it goes very, very fast. Let's look at this. This is ENIAC. This is an, an, an old computer from 1947, the first electronic computer. It's a fantastic machine, right? It was about 1,000 times faster than anything before. There was never a jump like this in computing. Seven multiplication of 10 digit numbers in one second. Uh, and then it's not very old. My father is older than this. Right? This was quite recently. Now, from this point in computing, uh, a so called Moore's law kicked in, not yet discovered at this time. So, so exponential growth meaning each year and a half about doubling twice, or doubling, right? Twice, twice more of everything that can be measured. Means each four years about 10 times growth of speed, of, of, of memory, of lowering of the price, complexity grows. Everything pretty much that can be measured about computers doubles every year and a half and goes 10 times fold better every four years. So now you know probably this is probably a myth about the checker, chessboard and, and, gra and grain of rice. So you put one here, then two, then four, double every square, and then at the end you get about 10 with 19 zeros. So, well, this really happens, right? It's not just, just a myth. It happens with the computer. Today's processors, you know, they are smaller, they have pieces that are smaller than viruses, and they really count in individual atoms in matter of size. And they, they go so fast that in one cycle of a processor that you have now in your phones, or, or the light travels less than 10 centimeters. Now, the, the biggest supercomputer now has, okay, has about 700,000 processors. Looks like this, right? And, and, and makes 10, I mean, one with 16 zeros of operations per second. It really did double every year and a half over decades, right? And now, you know, on, a, on the other, on the flip-flop side, now, this guy will be, out, will be useless in six years because it will drop out of the five, top 500 list in six years. Because, right now, it's number one. In six years, it will be number 500. It will be no use to even power it or cool it. It will just thrown out, most likely. Now, our, phone, our laptops now would make the top 500 list in, in 2002 
of supercomputers and would be the number one computer in the world, a laptop like this probably that I'm using for the presentation, in about 93. It would beat the computer, it's more powerful than the computer that beat Gary Kasparov in chess in 97, the deep blue. And it's really a huge progress, right? Now, why are computers important? Well, okay, so we can use them in science to do stuff like, drug, uh, like drugs, like, like study complex problems like weather. Drugs are important. They give us freedom from pain. You had a lecture about pain, right? This is really freedom not to feel pain all the time. Not everything is, can be done with drugs, as we learned, but, but it is helpful. It's for freedom. Then, you know, when you look at, the, at those letters, I, what I have in mind is that communication is absolutely crucial for people for the, for the civilization. So you could probably rank the invention of internet, maybe not as, as high as, as speech or writing, but probably better than the radio or printing press. It's really a huge invention for the society, for the, for the civilization. Now we can use computers to, to make better computers. And when we have a quantum computer eventually, that's my field indeed of expertise, then we probably will be able to use it to do really complex problems like, like the question of, of, of mind, of life, of consciousness of God maybe, right? Stuff like this maybe solved some of those problems, maybe become not just philosophical but scientific at some point. Now, it's real freedom if you can have access from your phone to entire, almost all information that there is, always, everywhere you are, for free. And it's not exactly this yet, right? But, but almost this. I mean, it, I, I, we probably know that a long time ago, books were very expensive and not everybody had books and not everybody had maps. And now we have all the information in our cell phones for free all the time. That's huge freedom. Now, of course, this is a symbol of some kind of you know, freedom effect of, of internet. Now, steam engine, it's an overused and cliche right, example of how uh, machines, how, how, civil, how, how, how science frees out of, of labor, of, of, of just degrading labor that kills our freedom as humans. Right, this, of course, has not gone away immediately. This is over 100 years later. I understand this is a very famous photograph, child at work. Right? We don't want this. Right? This is absolutely inhumane to put children to work instead of send them to school, even if it's homeschool, like, like, some, like, like we had a speaker t telling us about his sabbatical. Right? And, and now we can, I cannot prove this, right? but probably all will have some sense of this. The GDP, which is some kind of a measure of societies or, or places in the earth that, that value science and, and, and innovation and stuff, it really correlates with how many kids are at, at work rather than at school. And then if you look at how a big fraction of the population has to be delegated to produce food, it's not really freedom if you have just to do something not to die from hunger. Right? You're bound to do this to just survive. So, so that the percentage of people delegated to do this necessary duty rather than to, let's say, highly realize human potential, like taking photographs, right? It, it varies, and of course there is not strong, not, not clean correlation, but countries that develop science are more or less to the right, and those that, that don't are more or less to the left. We, Poland, are somewhere here where we have some stretch to cover, right? but we will, probably. Now, science, of course, has such a huge effect on, 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 on level of life in very broad terms, not just food and TVs, right, but just level of life in humane terms, that it, it, I cannot even encompass this. Right? Tr trivializing this, it produces technology and just knowledge of different kinds. And now this gives us wealth, this gives us health, and then gives us time. We live longer and we don't have to work so hard, so we have more time to really be humans and not just machines. Right? We have more energy now which maybe some people underappreciate, but you know, in the ancient times, everybody had to do stuff with hands, and now we have energy for this, so we, don't, we can read books during this time instead of working. Right? Now, now, we also, we, we need this freedom. I mean, we, humans are very you know, chickens, right? I mean, we, we are afraid of a lot of stuff. We have a lot of defense mechanisms against all fears, and we are, for example, afraid of unpredictability of the world around us. It's really scary, right? So, so science gives us this, there's this shielding, right, from fear of unpredictable world. And it's better shielding than some ancient solutions like, you know, some spooky religions from ancient Egypt or stuff that, that served this purpose before science was invented. Right, so it protects us and it even lets us use the, the laws of nature to our benefit, right? Uh, now, can, this is, again, an, a very sort of kind of cliche example of how 
now science, not of the dead stuff, not, not learning about the, the universe as a dead thing, but about us, right, humans, or, or other living organs, how this is important. And, okay, I'm not competent. We just, let's say, all kind of sense this, that medicine is important for, for our freedom as humans. I mean, we had a talk about pain, and okay, the conclusion was a little different, but I think it helps my case too. So th there, is, there is a number of, 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 of kind of inventions that we made as humans by means of science. And, and then that free us from things like pain, right? Now, children don't die. I mean, I, I heard that, that just a couple of hundred years ago, it was normal that kids died young. In, in, it was very common. I heard then, or read somewhere, that it proves that people could not love their children as much as we do now. Now we freak out. I have a daughter. I mean, my, I don't go to work. I mean, I, I just love my daughter. Right? And, and I think it's kind of neat. I mean, I, I, it. But, but I heard that it was impossible emotionally to invest so much love into a child if you pretty much knew that if you have four children, two of them will die young. And this happened apparently in high, you know, high developed countries not so long ago. So no, just, just this, this, this kind of this reassurance, this, this assurance that science can protect your children so that they will grow gives you freedom to love them without, you know, putting yourself at harm of just getting right, unhappy. And there are different, of course, parameters about level of life in those terms, and they correlate with GDP, which means more or less with development in scientific terms. So science of, of life, let's say, this helps us you know, to do different things, like, like live a you know, healthier life without pain. I don't remember which philosopher, but there was a famous philosopher that I, it could have been Nietzsche, but I'm not sure now, that I, I read that he basically lived from one pain to the next and just wrote something in between because just his life, life was basically enslaved by constant pain. Now, some of this we have cured by now. Right? I mean, you have painkillers. We, we didn't have them at some point ago. And now we have also just longer life. I know humans have just one life. I mean, okay, somebody can believe they have two, but with more likelihood, everybody has just one life. The longer it is, the more you can realize your potential and go you know, spend time with your family, read books and write poetry or go to the movies or do whatever is humane. The longer you have, the better, I think. Now, fear, right? I mean, we, we fear a lot of stuff and that's it's enslaving us. Now, science of mind, uh, uh, this is... Uh, uh, I only have one slide on this, and this is my kind of big hobby, but I knew I'm incompetent. Just, it's a hobby because I'm incompetent. But we had a great talk from Christian earlier about this memory thing, like how we really, it's not really true that our memories shape our identity, but rather our present, present time, our common sense, our knowledge, our identity now shapes our memories. It's, it's maybe not exactly what Christian said, but, but we, we just learn more and more about memory. We learn more and more about our mind, about our schematic behavior of our mind. How really sometimes even smart people are so dumb and they hurt each other and they're unhappy. And, and it would just help, and it happens now very lately, it's just really last decades. We learn more and more about human mind and hopefully, eventually, it will free us not to believe in some prejudice and superstition and some irrationality that enslaves us and has enslaved us since ever till almost now. And, and you know, people beat children just, just because they're dumb, right? I mean, and, and, and this will come from science, this realization of how mind works and what we are afraid of and why we shouldn't, and, and it will just make us happier, right? And freer people. Now, science, so, so let, let this be my, be my point, and, and it's not really a proof. I didn't prove, you know, probably some of you much better all this stuff than I, but it's just kind of my uh, deep conviction, let's put it this way, and that's what I wanted to share with you, that, that I believe that freedom is absolutely important, and it comes from knowledge. Dumb people are not free. And there's many ways to get knowledge, but science is a very important ingredient. And everybody with a brain has this responsibility for himself, herself, the society, children, neighbors, right? To, to learn, to read books and learn and have knowledge and be a free person. Thank you very much.